Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Maradian here in Orlando, Florida at the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium. Number one winter gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders as well as companies that supply the service, analysts, media, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And we're over here at General Electric to talk to uh, Dave Tweedy, uh, who is the Vice President for uh, Advanced Combat uh, Engines uh, at uh, GE. Dave, great seeing you. Great to see you here. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about sort of the history you guys have with uh, advanced engine programs, Advent. Uh, you guys have some news in terms of finishing detailed design uh, on your advanced uh, engine. That's kind of the big news here uh, from your guys' perspective. Um, a lot of this started with uh, the second engine and the F-35 program, that went away. Uh, there was a little bit of doubt as to where the next big breakthrough in engine technology will be. Not that Pratt can't handle it, but if folks wanted competition in that, it was a budget saving maneuver. But then there were a whole series of programs that were born. So walk the audience through and bring them up to speed on the work you've been doing and how each one of these programs, whether it's Advent or anything else, have sort of culminated in what you guys are doing now. Okay, uh, great question. So if we look back in history, GE's been working on adaptive cycle engine technology for a number of decades, in fact. And if you go back to about 2007 is when we really ramped up our seriousness of, pur of seriousness of purpose and investment from the Air Force launching the ADVENT program. So that started in 2007. That was actually completely parallel and independent of the F-136 program. Whereas the F-136 was really looking to be a head-to-head -head competitor against the F-135, two engine companies working to a common set of requirements. Advent was separated from any individual program of record and was focused on a generational leap in technology. The same that we saw in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, the jump from turbojet architectures to turbofan architectures. Uh, the Air Force felt that we were on the precipice to be able to invest to deliver that same generational leap from two-stream mixed-flow turbofan engines that have powered all of our fourth and fifth generation fleets to a three-stream adaptive cycle engine with advanced components and new architecture so we can make that same 25% improvement in fuel efficiency, 10% uh, plus more growth in, in thrust, as well as being able to tackle some thermal man management challenges on fifth and sixth generation airplanes. So that effort began in 2007 with the ADVENT program. Uh, working with our Air Force Research Lab customers, and about a five, six year program, really a pure science and technology play. Can we do a three stream adaptive cycle engine with advanced ceramic matrix composite components, additive technologies, high overall pressure issue, a whole suite of technologies that we were looking to advance in that program. Uh, that program completed in 2014, met all the customer deliverables and had a very successful core and three stream engine demonstration program. Right around 2012, so after the F-136 program was, was terminated, um, uh, the A AETD program uh, was launched, and that program went from the pure science and technology focus of the ADVENT program to what I call constrained optimization. Uh, the Air Force challenged industry to choose an application, a real world application, and see if you could take this three stream adaptive cycle engine technology and make it work on a real world, world aircraft. Can you make it fit? Can you make it flight weight? Can you make it durable? Single engine safety compatible? All the real world requirements that you're going to have to face before you bring this capability to the warfighter. And so that effort began in 2012, uh, progressed through a preliminary design and a series of rig, component rig and technology maturation risk reduction efforts successfully completed that program, and in 2016, uh, transitioning from our Air Force Research Lab customers over to the Life Cycle Management Center and launched the Adaptive Engine Transition Program, AETP. And so we've been working that since July of 2016, and the big news we have to announce here today is that we have wrapped up and completed the detailed design phase of that program, uh, which now enables us to start releasing our designs to our supply chain and our manufacturing base so that we can uh, get our parts made and get uh, multiple uh, full-scale flight weight engines ready for test. And um, you guys are doing a lot uh, in this program, and all the manufacturers are working on uh, all kinds of 3D uh, printing, uh, adaptive manufacturing. Talk to us a little bit about the role of some of these uh, new processes, how it's taking weight, how it's taking complexity out of these engines, because at the end of the day, the more parts you have, the more touch labor there is, the more complicated it is, the more failure points there are. Uh, talk to us about how you're harnessing some of these novel technologies and how the technology itself is changing to enable you to do things in a very different way. That's, that's uh, 
we'd love to talk about that. So there's tremendous synergy uh, between our commercial products and our military products when it comes down to the component level technologies and manufacturing techniques. And let's use ceramic matrix composites as, as the prime example. So we started, we've been working with ceramic matrix composites over the years on a number of military demonstrator programs, including the ADVENT program and AATD. Um, but as we started to prove out the, the capability of the technology that it could work, that's when our commercial products, our LEAP products, our GE9X products, have latched on and taken those products from what I'll call a TRL5, TRL6, up to TRL8, TRL9, and also driven tremendous amount of investment in our industrialization and producibility efforts. Right? So it's one thing to make a one-off test engine for a military demonstrator program. It's a very different challenge to scale up to make 2,000 engines a year uh, with large uh, pressures on cost from a commercial basis. And so that's what our team has been hard at work at over a number of years on the commercial side, driving producibility investment. We have a fully vertically integrated domestic supply chain with, with ceramic matrix composites. And so now when we look at our ability to transition this technology into a three-stream adaptive cycle engine and bring that capability to the warfighter, they're going to benefit from all of that investment, over a billion dollars that GE's invested to mature that technology and get it ready. So we believe we can bring that uh, to the Air Force at quality, at, at scale, uh, and make it a, this wonderful capability affordable for them as well. And certainly, you know, ceramic mixtures, comets, composites is one technology, additive is another technology where strong synergy between commercial and military, where military kind of proves out the, the potential for the, for the technology, commercial really industrializes it to, to scale and bring costs down, and then we leverage that back into our, our military products when we bring them out to the field. It's, uh, it's uh, truly a virtuous cycle, and I, I'm sorry, I said adaptive, I meant um, additive manufacturing, uh, because I had adaptive uh, on the brain. Um, General Electric prides itself on being the first American jet was powered by General Electric uh, motor. It was obviously the license uh, of uh, the British design, which was the Whittle uh, engine that went into uh, the Air Comet, um, which was uh, a Bell uh, aircraft. Uh, full disclosure, Bell uh, is one of our sponsors of our podcast. And full disclosure, GE Marine was one of our spa, uh, sponsors at the uh, Surface uh, Navy Association. It will be again at the Navy League show. Um, talk to us a little bit about as you guys look, you know, if you look at each one of these generations of engines, J79, 110, each one was sort of, you know, they were technological marvels in their day, but they also were quantum leaps, either in reliability or power uh, or, you know, fuel consumption. As you guys sort of map, you know, how, how much more, as you, as you guys do, as you put that dotted graph, you know, how much more efficiency can you eke out of these kinds of turbine designed engines before you've got to, you hit and you plateau in terms of what is the art of the possible. Because if you look at the whole history of the gas turbine, it's unbelievable about the kind of power. I mean, I know it's not your d d division, uh, but the AS2, you know, the engine that will go into Ariane's AS2, I mean, you're talking about a large faced high bypass turbofan that's going to drive an airplane at supersonic speed, which even a fighter needs an afterburner to get you to that speed, and yet you're going to be doing that with, uh, you know, what is essentially a CFM 56 cord engine. Um, you know, how, how much more growth room is there when you're trying to get power out of this kind of a package? Right, it, it's hard for me to say, put an exact number on it, and, but that's one of the reasons for programs like ADVENT, AETD, and AETP. Uh, if you plot out technology curves, we have an S-curve where it takes quite a bit to, of investment to start seeing some benefit, then there's a radical uh, improvement in capability over time as you continue to unlock and understand the technology. And then it does start to plateau, and we saw that with uh, turbojet architectures, and towards the end as that technology started to plateau, that's when you saw the shift to two-stream mixed flow turbofan engines, and then you you're on a whole different technology curve. And our opinion is that uh, for fighter engines, we've kind of started to plateau with the conventional two-stream mixed flow architecture that you really can only squeeze out incrementally more performance benefits, especially when you think about the thermal demands that are on fifth and sixth generation airplanes that really just weren't part of the design space in third and fourth generation. So once you do that, we believe a brand new architecture, the three-stream adaptive cycle approach, enabled by the advanced components that we talked about, puts you on a whole new curve. And so the work that we've done believe that, that we're able to, with low risk, introduce that into the field, but then I think that puts us the first point on the next curve. So I think that there's a number of incremental improvements with component technologies continuing to make more parts of the engine variable that one can continue to squeeze out more and more thrust, fuel efficiency, thermal management, and that could carry us for, for a while, and then we need to start thinking about you know the next step from a, a different architecture. So it's really, um, 
to, to me, it's changing architectures is what really allows you to go from an incremental bene uh, benefit to transformational that we think we can provide. Uh, heat is efficiency is power, but at some point, right, you have to get rid of you have to get rid of uh, uh, get get rid of the heat. And when uh, Dave is the uh, engine going to fly? Do you guys have a first flight test uh, goal date out uh, there? We don't have a first flight goal. Uh, we are heading into a series of multiple engine tests uh, in the balance of ATP pro programs. So I think throughout 2020 and 2021, we've got a very robust and thorough uh, ground test program that we're currently funded to go execute, and that's what we're looking forward to to going forward and getting that data. And a quick form, fit, and function. You know, if you talk to Lockheed guys uh, and Air Force guys, you know, everybody is looking at the potential of future re-engineering to get better range, mm -hmm. uh, get better payload capability. Obviously, the B, uh, and we're going to talk to your uh, B-52 folks uh, here, which is also one of the talks of the show. Uh, but if you look at it from an F-35 standpoint, in going to another generation airplane, how much percentage-wise range performance increase do you think that there would be that you guys are shooting for to be able to deliver, for example, for a jet like the F-35? Great question. So the, the whole purpose of the Advent ATD and ATP programs was to mature this technology to be available for multiple aircrafts, whether they're legacy aircrafts, current production aircrafts like an F-35 and future aircrafts that are still on the drawing boards. And the reality is we, were, we selected the F-35 as the design target vehicle. Uh, as part of the ATD and ATP program. So that requires, that is the str most smooth transition uh, uh, process for, to get this technology to the warfighter. So the XA100 engine that we just got through detailed design fits and integrates well with the F-35, with the support equipment for the F-35. And so, you know, we, we think it's a pretty smooth transition in that 25% fuel burn advantage that you get, we think translates into greater than 30% range increase and tremendous other warfighting capability for the F-35. So we stand ready if and when the Air Force would, would like to transition and, and uh, capitalize on the significant investment that they have made, uh, along with the industry cost share that's been made to, to try to get this capability out to the warfighter. And uh, last question, uh, so how much of this is retrofitable in existing engines, right? Because one approach is you put a whole new engine in it, but then again, each one of the manufacturers does block, mod because these are modular engines, you do modular upgrades to it. How much of this technology is modular upgradable to kind of power plants that are out there today? Okay, you know, we, we feel there, there's certainly always a path to do modular or component level improvements to get incremental improvements to existing products. But to really get the big double digit numbers that we're talking about, we've always felt that it, the, the, it's the architecture that really unlocks that potential. So moving to a clean sheet architecture enabled by the advanced components are really what unlocks the true capability if you want to have a step jump uh, rather than the, a more traditional incremental improvement process that, that is always done on, on most products. Dave Tweedy, uh, Vice President of General Electric's Advanced Combat Engines. Dave, uh, thanks uh, very much. Really uh, appreciate the time. Great conversation. Thank you very much.